Hi, this is Dr. Cook, your Chem 240 instructor. Let's take a look at the next video. In this video, we're going to start talking about reactions and mechanisms by which uh, molecules are converted from one into another. Most reactions are not involving just a single step, but occur over multiple steps, and we need to describe how those individual steps on the way from starting material to products elapses. So when we talk about reactions, we have general classes of reactions, and they can be summarized in four different classes. Addition reactions, where we take two different molecules and bring them together and connect them to form a new product. That would be called an addition reaction. The opposite of that, where a molecule breaks apart into two or more molecules, would be referred to as an elimination reaction. If you take a molecule and one part comes off and another part goes on, we refer to that as a substitution reaction. This is usually occurring at the same location in a molecule. And if you're simply reorganizing bonds or moving things around and you haven't lost or gained any atoms, then we call that a rearrangement reaction. And we're going to see examples of all these throughout the semester. Most importantly for alkenes and alkynes, we'll be discussing addition reactions. Now when we talk about reactions, what we're talking about is bonds breaking and bonds forming. And we need to understand how bonds can break and how they can form. Uh, bonds could break in what we refer to as a homolytic fashion to produce free radicals, in which case a covalent bond breaks giving one electron to each of the departing species. This is the basis for radical polymerization and some other things. Most often in organic chemistry we'll be talking about polar reactions where a bond breaks and the pair of electrons that were in the bond are kept by one of those uh, sides of the molecule that came off and the other side is left efficient. In this case this forms ions typically so in the case of A bonded to B if it breaks to form uh, B minus then A will be left as a plus. Now some other terminology, we can also talk about reactions where something that has a lot of electron density, something that's electron rich, can react to form a new bond to something that's electron poor. Now, this is the case if this is an H plus and a Cl minus, where a Cl minus will react to form HCl, or an acid base reaction. This is a polar reaction where we're forming a new bond from a lone pair of electrons to something that's looking for electrons. And we refer to this as an electrophile, that that's electron poor. Electrophile, file meaning the term for love, so uh, electron loving, it's seeking electrons. It is electron deficient itself, so it needs electrons. And the other partner in a polar reaction is an electron-rich species. It has electrons it wants to give. So we call that a nucleophile. In other words, it's um, in love with a nucleus. It's looking for positive charge or something that's electron deficient. So when we bring these two partners together, it's an electrophile and nucleophile reaction. In any polar reaction, whether it be an addition, elimination, uh, whatever, we can always identify something as uh, being a nucleophile or something being an electrophile. Specifically, if we're going to talk about alkene reactivity, we have to remember what the structure of an alkene is. And it is a planar molecule, as we've discussed in the previous chapter, with p orbitals that reside above and below the plane. And this is a source of a lot of electron density. As you can see from this electrostatic map of the electron density, a lot of electron density is located in this pi bond. So how do you think an alkene is going to react? It's going to react at, with these electrons as a nucleo file. In other words, it's looking for something that's electron deficient. It wants to share those electrons by breaking the pi bond. We're going to see many examples of this chemistry. The most characteristic reaction of alkenes is an addition reaction. And there are many different kinds of addition reactions. We can add different things to it. And these are electrophilic additions is what we refer to them because usually it's something that's electron deficient which is adding first in the case of an H plus or an X plus, a halogen plus, um, H plus, or a boron plus. We can see that uh, these reactions occur to form an addition product where the initial double bond is broken and we've added the two groups, one on either side. We're going to talk a lot about how this reaction proceeds, but in the case of adding two hydrogens, we call this a hydrogenation reaction or often referred to as a reduction because we've reduced the molecule from an alkene to an alkane. 
If we add HCl or HBr or something like that, we refer to that as a hydrohalogenation. So a hydrochlorination or a hydrobromination, we've added a hydrogen and a halogen across the double bond. We can add both halogens, so Cl2, Br2, I2, these will all add um, as electrophiles first to the double bond to put a halogen on either end where the double bond used to be. Um, there are ways to add water, so we can add H and OH across a double bond to generate an alcohol functional group. And we're going to talk a little bit about hydroboration where we've added a hydrogen and a boron across a double bond. And this boron is important because these intermediates then can be converted into an OH. There's a reaction to take boron and make it into an OH group. And it changes the position of adding an OH that's a complementary to adding water. And we're going to see that later. So in order to understand electrophilic additions to double bonds, I want to take this example of a hydrobromination of an alkene. Ethene has um, electron density in the pi system, as I've shown here in the electrostatic map. And we have a reaction with HBr. And we've added the H on one end and the Br on the other. And the pi bond that was there originally is no longer present. So how does this reaction proceed? It doesn't add all at once. It's not a single step reaction. It actually, it occurs over multiple steps. We're going to talk a lot about this, but the first step is to first add the hydrogen across the double bond. I'm, I'm eliminating the other hydrogens for clarity. That leaves the other carbon deficient of electrons. And then we add the minus group to where the plus charge is. This would be, in this case, bromide. Okay, So it's a two step reaction. We're going to talk a lot about this mechanism. OK, let's take a, a little bit closer look at this reaction, the electrophilic addition of HBr to a double bond, or HX if I want to be generic. In this case, what we have is a double bond reacting with the hydrobromic acid, forming a new product where hydrogen added to one end of where the double bond was and bromine added to the carbon at the other end. The pi bond is no longer present. It's now an sp3 hybridized alkane in this case a bromoalkane. How does this reaction work? Well, it's important to understand where the electron density is. And as I described previously, the electron density of the alkene is residing in the pi bond. And that's the bond that actually gets broken in this process. So let's take a closer look at how this works step by step. Because it's not a single step reaction. And we can describe this as individual steps. So in this case, the first step is the electron density of the double bond. The pi bond breaks by being protonated by the HBr. So it's taking the H plus from HBr. And you've noticed that's been added to the molecule here. I happen to put it on this carbon for this example. That leaves the other carbon deficient. The carbon where the double bond departed from, those two electrons are now in the bond to the hydrogen. So this carbon is left with a positive charge. We refer to this as a carbocation. And this is an intermediate structure. This is not very stable. It's pretty high in energy, and it doesn't sit around very long, particularly if you have a nucleophile around, such as bromide. So in this case, the bromide, which has electrons to share, is looking for a nucleus. It's a nucleophile. And it will form a bond by sharing its electrons with the carbon that is deficient. That generates now a new bond between carbon and bromine at the site of where that plus charge is. Now we as chemists like to graph these things out and take a look at how this reaction proceeds. And we use a, what we refer to as a reaction energy diagram to describe the energetics of the materials that we're interacting as it proceeds from starting material to products. Here is an example of a basic reaction energy diagram for a one-step reaction. And so you can see what I've identified here as starting materials. That would be both the alkene and the HBr. And the, their combination of energies is here. So we have energy in the y-axis. The progress of the reaction, which is a multi-component uh, axis uh, that's a little bit difficult to describe. You can think about this as the course of the time frame of the reaction as the reactants turn into products. What happens as you start to make and break bonds is that the energy of the reactants rises. And you get to a maximum point, which we refer to as the transition state. That's the highest energy state along a reaction pathway. 
Once it gets to there, the reaction proceeds to continue to make and break bonds until you get to the products. And in this example, I've shown the products as lower in energy. So this is an exothermic reaction. Exothermic because the products are lower in energy, so going from starting material to products, you've released a certain amount of energy. This is the heat of reaction. If the products happen to be higher in energy, let's say the products were at this point, uh, this would then require more energy than what you started with. And we refer to this as endothermic, endothermic. So the delta H is uh, in this direction, not this direction. We have another term here which we refer to as activation energy. That's the energy required to get over the hill or over the maximum energy point along the reaction progress. So from your starting material to the highest point of the uh, reaction, that requires a certain amount of energy be put in. And you can think about this as riding your bike over a hill. You start at some point at the base of the mountain and you need to put in energy to climb that mountain to get to the very top. And once you get to the very top, then you can coast down to your finish line. It's the same thing for reactions. You need to put in a certain amount of energy to climb the energy barrier to reach the transition state. And then uh, it's downhill to the products from there. Well, this is a one-step reaction. Let's take a look at an example where we have a two-step reaction because in addition reactions, we're going to be talking about two-step reactions. You can see we have the same thing here, except now we have two hills. One of them happens to be lower than the other, and that could be the first hill or the second hill in a two-step reaction. I just happened to provide an example where the transition state for the first hill is higher than the transition state for the second hill. So if you think about this reaction progress, we have starting materials. Uh, that begin to react, and in this case it's the first step of an electrophilic addition reaction. That would be a carbon-carbon double bond reacting with HBr where the alkene takes the hydrogen, the proton, to generate our carbocation intermediate. And that's this, this first step. We need to reach some maximum point and then we go down into a well. This is the intermediate. This is the carbocation. Notice in this case it's higher in energy than the starting materials. Um, because it is a reactive intermediate. It doesn't stick around. It has to go on to products. And the second step, the reaction with the bromide to form now the carbon-bromine bond to get to the products, also requires a bit of activation. From the intermediate, you do need to climb a little bit of a hill before you can go back down to the products. Now since these two different reaction steps have different energies of the transition state, one is going to be higher than the other. So the rate determining step is the step that has the highest activation energy. That's going to be the slowest step because the amount of energy it takes dictates the speed of the reaction. So we refer to this as the rate determining step, the one that takes the most amount of activation energy. And so if you compare this activation energy for the first step versus this activation energy for the second step, you can see that this one on the left is much greater. So in this case, we can say that the first step in this two-step reaction path is the slowest step and the rate determining step. As we go on and talk about reaction mechanisms in this class, I want to bring up some general common steps that occur when talking about reactions proceeding from starting materials to products. Some of these come up commonly over and over again in different contexts, and so I want to be clear that we have some of these common steps in mind when we're thinking about reactions. So the first one is what we refer to as protonation. As the name describes, it's simply adding a proton to something. So in the case of electrophilic addition of HBr, we've added a proton to the double bond. So the electrons in the double bond have taken the proton, um, freeing this up, and generating as a byproduct the anion. So in this case, um, the, we can say that the alkene has been protonated. There are other types of protonations we're going to see later on. For example, if you have something like a carbonyl compound reacting with an acid catalyst like sulfuric acid, we can protonate that. That is, the lone pair of the oxygen takes the proton to form now a protonated species and the anion. So this is also referred to as a protonation. Many reaction steps begin by some kind of protonation step. Well, the opposite of protonation is, of course, deprotonation, and the, it's a proton transfer. We can say in this case that the OH minus 
took the proton from ammonium and became protonated. So this is a protonation step. But if we want to focus our discussion on what the proton came off of, we refer to this as a deprotonation. So the proton that was on this ammonium in this case is being deprotonated by the OH- to form the deprotonated ammonia species. And there are again many examples of different kinds of deprotonations that we can talk about from heteroatoms such as nitrogen, oxygen, or taking protons off of carbons, etc. So this occurs as a common step in reaction mechanisms when we are talking about step-by-step -step reaction progress. A third step in reactions that's common is what we refer to as a nucleophile electrophile reaction. That is, we're forming some bond between something which is an electrophile, which is looking for electrons, it's electron deficient or electron poor, in this case a carbocation, or a nucleophile, uh, such as a halide ion, which has a pair of electrons that wants to form another bond. And so in this case, we are simply making a new covalent bond between X minus and C plus to generate this reaction. This would be an electrophilic or nucleophilic polar reaction and it's a common step. This could occur at the same time as bond breaking as well and we will see when we talk about alkyl halide chapters when we have halogen compounds and we have some nucleophile like let's just take OH minus we can form a bond to this carbon at the same time the bromine bond breaks this is a substitution reaction, but it's also a nucleophile and electrophile reaction. We refer to this as a nucleophilic substitution because the nucleophile is attacking the electrophilic carbon, kicking off the bromine. We'll see much more details of this in a later chapter. We're going to talk in this chapter about rearrangements, and this occurs when you've sim simply shifted bonds around in a molecule or shifted atoms and changed what atoms it's bonded to. In this case, I've shown an example of a carbocation structure where we have a carbon-hydrogen bond next to it, and this hydrogen bond shifts over one carbon switching places with the carbocation and what's happening here is the two electrons in the bond simply move over so the, the, the hydrogen with the electrons hops over to form a new bond leaving the carbon it departed from now deficient. The only thing we've done in this molecule we haven't broken anything off or added anything to it we've simply rearranged the bonds so this is a rearrangement reaction. We're going to see examples of carbocation rearrangements in this chapter. In later chapters we're going to see examples of bonds that simply break and they usually break when we can form relatively stable ions. So in this case what we have is a, a carbon halogen bond in which the carbon ha and halogen simply breaks apart in a heterolytic fashion so the halogen retains the electrons that were in the bond leaving the carbon with a plus charge. This is a common step in some substitution reactions and in some other reactions that we'll see later.